Hannah's house, uh, we being Lou de Bourbon and Elizabeth Meek, and uh, we're sitting in this incredible collection of books in a very beautiful home in a wonderful, magical spot near. Uh, is it Marin County? No, it's Sonoma This County. is Sonoma Western County. Sonoma County. Far from Sonoma. Talking. So I, I will tape the conversation and... Um, and uh, if Terrence has special information that he'd like you all, you aware people of the United States, to have, he'll let us have it. And we will mention the fact that he has a new book which is on cassette, and he'll talk some about that too and where it can be ordered. That's all. That feel like a good introduction to everybody? Yeah, that sounds fun. Okay, here we go. Okay. Well, maybe I'll just uh, start out by asking a couple of questions that have been on my mind. Uh, uh, fascination with the um, combination of uh, DMT and harmine and things of this nature. And um, what I'm interested in is, is those places or plants or animals or ways in which people can come um, close to or have historically come close to or have had, had access to DMT. And I remember you briefly mentioned uh, a process whereby, by combining rabbit lungs, say, and pig intestines, you could actually, in some way, create or obtain DMT. And I was wondering if you could go into a little more detail on how, how that could be done. Oh, I'm not. I don't. I'm not sure pig intestines is the second ingredient. But what you need is a source of tryptophan which is a common amino acid, and then rabbit lung, which uh, is uh, replete with an O-methylation enzyme, O-methyltransferase, and it will O-methylate the tryptamine into a psychoactive, which is just an example of uh, what's called cauldron chemistry, where you use animal enzymes to do chemical transformations. Another one that has been discussed in the literature is uh, using uh, the decarboxylation activity of enzymes in raw milk to decarboxylate the poison in Amanita muscaria, which is muscarine, to the hallucinogen, which is muscamole. And in Wasson's book on soma, he discusses the fact that the soma, whatever it was, was whipped together with milk curd and allowed to stand. And this was one of the major ar uh, arguments for identifying it as Amanita muscaria, because that would make it much more palatable and less toxic. But who knows how many of these things uh, exist, you know, because we have lost the lore of special uses for animal organs and that sort of thing. I and mean, that really is shamanic lore that we've lost touch with. Are, are you familiar with the um, um, the newt, the California newt, or the importance of the tetrodotoxin and the fugu? Perhaps uh, maybe you could go a little bit into the, the fish, uh, if you want, and of course the newt in that sense. The before, we, before we get into that much of a technical thing, I wonder if it's possible to tell people why we think this is important. Can, can, can we just discuss I mean, that why for a is it, why, why, why is it important to track down these natural sources of the psychedelic experience? Yes. Well, it's important because the psychedelic experience is important in and of itself, but it's important to involve ourselves with these biological materials because the things which come out of the laboratory, of which there's a potentially unlimited number, uh, are not receiving the kind of uh, animal and human testing that they would if they were above-ground drugs. So safety is really a concern of mine and what I've been telling people recently is uh, that until there is animal and human data on a drug it should probably be looked at very carefully uh, 
If you look at naturally occurring hallucinogens with a tradition of human use, you don't have to worry about that because, you, for instance, the mushrooms, we know that they were used in the mountains of Mexico for at least two millennia. Uh, ditto the morning glories in Mexico. So uh, in the absence of good scientific data about the effects of artificial hallucinogens, it's good to stick to the natural ones. And it also, an, a more interesting interesting and kind of more um, philosophical case can be made if you accept the theory of Rupert Sheldrake of morphogenetic fields because you have to realize then that the morphogenetic field of a drug like psilocybin which has been in living systems perhaps 120 million years been used by human beings perhaps 20,000 years, what is its morphogenetic field going to be like contrasted to a drug made six weeks ago in the laboratory? It's the depth of these things. You see, the new drugs are empty. They haven't taken enough people yet to fill up. But what you see with something like... Uh, psilocybin or morning glory seeds or something like that is the accumulation of the experience of all the people who ever took these things. I mean, that's why you're reaching back into a human family spread out over millennia and actually being those shaman. You are those shaman or you are participating in the, the personality of the over shaman, if you wish. So that is... Uh, <coughs> The basis for an ontological distinction between artificial and naturally occurring drugs of all types, but especially hallucinogens, which have this intellectual content. Gee, that's the best explanation of, the, uh, of a, a, a case for organic um, psychedelics that I've heard. Stephen said a long time ago, when we were on the caravan, 12 years ago, I guess, that we should stop using LSD because so many people had used it in such paranoid uh, circumstances that the vibrational rate was no longer such that you could know that you were going to have an ecstatic trip. Any well, that is an intuitive understanding of what exactly what Sheldrake was saying. The reason I've been thinking about this recently was because I s was at a conference recently on psychedelics, a closed conference mostly for healthcare professionals, and there was a lot of talk about Adam MDMA. And uh, then someone asked the question, what is the LD50 of it? L LD50 is a fairly unpleasant concept, which is necessary to understand in pharmacology. The LD50 is the dose at which half the mice die, or half the dogs die. And all drugs are tested this way. And what you want with a drug is a drug with where the LD50 is hundreds or thousands of times more than the effective dose. For instance, uh, the effective dose of psilocybin is about 20 milligrams. The LD50 for psilocybin is uh, 375 milligrams per kilogram. So we're talking 30,000 milligrams for a 145-pound human being. The problem that emerged with Adam was that the LD50 is very close to the effective dose and that no human trials have ever been done. The effective dose of Adam is considered to be somewhere between 75 and 150 milligrams. Mm -hmm. The LD50 is considered to be 500 milligrams based on studies of dogs. Now, I'll, let me explain this so it doesn't sound too alarmist. Dogs are not good creatures to extrapolate to human beings. Uh, practice has shown that mice are much better, that, that the LD50 of mi in mice will be more generally close to the LD50 in primates, including man, than data on dogs or cats. Nevertheless, in the absence of any human data whatsoever about Adam, uh, it's very unnerving that 
the LD50 is so close to the effective dose. So immediately, the institution which was holding this conference, which probably would prefer to be anonymous, pledged $1,000 to study the problem. Someone at the conference pledged $1,000. And... Uh, <coughs> Tests will begin with sophisticated human volunteers who will uh, clear their systems and then take it and then have massive uh, blood work done. This is the short-term human uh, data will come out of that. The long-term human data is beyond the financial capability of the underground. But you see, this is interesting, so let me take a moment because it's important for people. Um, there's only one drug in the world which is safe, strangely enough. In other words, there's only one drug in the world that no one knows how much it takes to kill you. And that drug is LSD-25. And this is a very fortunate thing because people in the 1960s got into the habit. I remember Tim Leary said, when in doubt, double the dose. Completely reasonable advice for LSD. The problem is LSD is the only drug with such a benign profile so that uh, we can't carry the, the dose estimation habits that we formed on LSD into these new amphetamines like MDA, MDMA, Adam, Ecstasy, because uh, they are, it's well known among chemists that the, uh, uh, the cyclicized amphetamines are toxic. Mescaline is the most toxic of all natural hallucinogens. MDMA is four times as toxic as mescaline. So at this conference, we, a, a great deal of, of thought was put into... There were people there who were so enthusiastic about the um, effects of Adam, the, the psychological effects, <laughs> that they felt that this was the greatest chance the underground had ever had to actually obtain a quasi-legal or legal status for a hallucinogen. The problem is this, uh, this uh, toxicological data makes it clear that it could never be legalized. And in fact, if Adam cured the common cold, it would not be legalized if it has a uh, LD50 profile only four times the effective dose. So I had up until this time not... Uh, formulated, I had had a preference for botanical drugs, but I had not formulated what is the real difference, you know, and when you would argue with people that synthetics and, natu and organic drugs were different, they could eventually argue you to the point where you just couldn't defend it because they seemed to be the same. But with Sheldrake, the notion of Sheldrake, that the morphogenetic field attends the compound, and the absence mainly of human data, I mean, uh, we went through a ketamine phase with moderate amounts of human data, although now I see in Science News last week there's fear that it depresses the immune system. In fact, it does depress the immune system. Well, leaving aside its uh, use in the underground, the worst thing an anesthetic can do is depress your immune system because you're going to have surgery and come out of surgery and be in a surgical recovery ward. You want your immune system to just be fully revved up. Now we have this problem, apparently, with Adam. And in fact, there has been one reported death at a dose of 390 milligrams. Um, Thanks for that information. It's really important to get out because there's so much enthusiasm about it. Well, Adam, I'm standing. Right? I told Tom these things, and he was floored. I'm sure he was. And we had a long talk about it. And it's we have to take responsibility, you know, the underground, because we can't have. Another drug scandal would finish uh, psychedelic research above and underground for the rest of this century. So uh, it's a problem with the uh, people's uh, courage 
I mean, let's contrast two drugs for a minute. Here we have psilocybin, effective at the 20 milligram dose, and uh, you would have to take, as I said, probably close to two and a half dried pounds of the mushrooms that are on sale in the Bay Area to approach the fatal dose. Nevertheless, if you take 40 milligrams of psilocybin, you will swear that you are at death's door, you know. You will swear that you are looking at the path to the bardo. And, uh, but with Adam, it's totally the feeling, the aura is that it's completely benign, even as you approach a fantastically dangerous dose. That, it is amazing because Adam puts you in this state of love even for itself. That's what happens. And you know, and I t discussed this with Lou coming down, it seems to me that my experience with Adam is that I'm so much in love, <clears throat> in a state of love that it's dangerous in other ways because I accept, Too much. I accept things that I shouldn't really accept that aren't the best for That's me. Right. So it's uh, some... Boy, it's well, fascinating. See, so I've heard of people who essentially to become courageous enough to get really stoned take Adam ahead of it. In other words, people say, well, I take Adam and then I take LSD an hour and a half later. Or I take psilocybin an hour and a half later. Well, I think that the, these are, you know, in the absence of human data, this is all very chancy stuff. We have to realize that LSD was a godsend special, miraculous case. I mean, it was amazing to pharmacologists that it was so non-toxic. The CIA gave an elephant six grams and, you know, it laid down for three days and then it got up and shook its head and wandered off to look for something to eat. So... <laughs> But we must be more responsible. So I've actually formulated it down to a little test, which is if you are interested in the spiritual path utilizing hallucinogens, then the hallucinogen you use should be able to answer yes to two of the following three questions. Does it have a history of shamanic usage? Does it occur in the tissue of a plant or animal? And then let me think. You can't think of that <laughs> Ah. Does it bear a similarity to compounds that occur in our own brains? Well, we're just discovering a lot of those compounds, though. That's we don't right. know them all yet. Well, but as I said, you have to be able that. to answer yes to, to two, two of those. three. So then, so LSD would actually pass two of those as that's far right. as the Eleusinian mysteries, where it was utilized for thousands of years, and and it's occurring in, in, in the brain. Well, and it also it occurs in, in morning, morning glory glories scenes. and ergotized rye, and uh, so yes. Uh, and if we do that, I don't think we'll get into trouble. And I also I want to make this clear. We will not be denying ourselves any dimension of importance. In other words, I notice people have the attitude that you have to take all drugs to know what's going on. And what I find is that you find out far more about what's going on if you take a few drugs at progressively more and more heroic doses. I also, and I invite uh, experimenters to try this, at the moment there is so much attention directed toward Adam that the morphogenetic field of Adam is so strong that if you will take psilocybin, you can request it to masquerade as Adam and it will immediately turn over and be Adam for you. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> And I don't think Adam can do the same trick going the other way. Well, uh, do you mind if I talk? I, I mean, ahead, please do join the conversation. Now, I know you want to get more technical, but no, I no, want to I'm, save I'm, it a little bit. Sure, uh, but well, that's all I want to say about Well, I, I've got some questions. Okay. But, uh, uh, oh, God. What did you just say about psilocybin? Oh, that it would turn yes, over. I want, could you run down for people, uh, if I understand you correctly, Terrence, I understand that you believe 
or it, it, the reality that the, the spore of psilocybin mushrooms are in are alien intelligence or intelligence from uh, other areas of the galaxy or universe. Would you tell us a little about that? Well, it's not a belief of mine. It's just a case, I knew I a knew case that. I make because I want to stretch the imaginations of evolutionary biologists and everybody else who's looking at the living kingdom. And it is certainly true that spores appear to be genetically engineered for space flight. They are a color, deep purple. I'm now talking about the spores of Stepheri cubensis. They're a deep purple color which absorbs UV. That's the color you would paint a spaceship. They uh, uh, survive best in conditions most like those of space. In other words, high vacuum, <coughs> low temperature. They uh, are small enough that they could, through Brownian motion and then the formation of global electrical currents on their sur forming on their surfaces high up in the atmosphere, actually percolate out into outer space, much the way, for instance, that the much of the atmosphere of Mars has drifted away over millions of years. And uh, I think that the experience, well, that's basically a case for that they are a biological entity able to migrate between the stars by through utilizing convective flow and light pressure and that sort of thing. A more radical proposition based on the experience of psilocybin is that that organism is intelligent. Or, or that it is able to transfer information, that it is somehow a form of life which is able to communicate with us when it is uh, locating in our nervous systems, that it comes to its fullest flower in the organism of a higher animal, and that in that state it is there is the potential for an I-Thou uh, exchange and phenomenologically, there's no question about this, that there is this I-Thou exchange with psilocybin. Uh, but people can say, uh, you know, you can, a psychologist can say, well, it's an autonomous psychic component that has slipped out of the control of the ego, and you're dialoguing with that, or whatever. But I think when you've had the experience, uh, the overwhelming impression is that you are having a conversation with a very strange, very old, very different kind of organism. And uh, based on that, and as I say, these physical arguments about the survivability of the spore and its adaptability to the outer space environment, I want to suggest that space may be no barrier to the migration of forms of many forms of life, not just forms of life possessing spaceships, and that probably many times in the Earth's history, spores have drifted down and become part of things. And this is not a radical theory at all. Uh, uh, Crick of Crick and Watson holds the same view and believes that probably the galaxy is a biome. The galaxy is a biological unit. And we are just coming to the level of scientific and cultural and awareness to recognize these things. And of course, I think this argument seems preposterous unless you have had the experience on fairly high doses of psilocybin of actually meeting this alien entity, which is an experience very different from the classical psychedelic experience established through the use of LSD and mescaline. Those seem to be largely explorations of human dimensions, psychoanalytic and the collective unconscious of Jung, dimensions of historical resonance and, uh, and that sort of thing. But there was not the prevalence of the extraterrestrial theme that you get with the tryptamine, psilocybin and DMT especially. These seem to be ways of communicating with a nearby world of alien intelligence, which may or may not be space-based. It may be hyperdimensional, or it may be earth-based. These may be the elves and fairies of folklore. 
the human experience is so bounded by language, we don't realize how our scientific and linear expectations of the world hide from us the real complexity of what's going on. Mm-hmm. Well, oh, uh, mm-hmm. did you have something you would like to say or ask or comment on? Um, how are we doing, Tom Weiss? No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I didn't mean to stop. That's the all show right. I have. <laughs> I have. I, it was a great uh, little. I, I have a question then. Uh, in the experience of ac- actual extraterrestrial intelligence embodied in form, which I've read uh, and heard you describe before, uh, <clears throat> is there a is there a place where you go? I'm mean, asking a question. In the psychedelic experience with psilocybin at any rate and DMT forms where you go into the molecular form uh, like, and then out another side that forms itself into forms that we're not familiar with here in our 3D land you actually go through the mandala the molecular mandala well I had never cognized it that way but that's an interesting way to think of it it's as though the molecule turns your mind through another dimension and you see something which is co-present with reality as it were but between the spaces sort of and suddenly the phase shift occurs i remember when i was a child i had this toy which was a a flat piece of paper with a uh, circus cage printed on it. And when you moved the bars one way, there was a zebra in the cage. When you slid the bars the other way and covered all the parts of the zebra, a tiger was revealed. And this is uh, something about the nature of reality, that there seems to be at least one other continuum co-present. And this is why our folklore is uh, haunted by elves, genies, jinns, afrites, demons, uh, all these curious creatures of folklore, which, you know, wouldn't be there if there was not some experiential basis for them. It's just that we have crowded into cities and then crowded into condominiums, and we don't experience what goes on with the single person in vast wilderness in a life lived based on experience of the present at hand rather than vast abstract systems of explanation dictated by science and government and that sort of thing. Would you, would you like to comment at all on uh, uh, what you think the psychedelic experience is with your knowledge of the chemistry of the plants and uh, so forth and of the physiology of the body and the kind of experiences you've had? Do you have any idea what it is? What? What is it? Well, I'll tell you what I think it is, but it's not really based on physiology or pharmacology. It's based on carefully looking at the experience. Plato said time is the moving image of eternity. And I think that what these psychedelics do is they actually do connect you to the whole circle. You stand outside of the moment from which you embarked on your psychedelic experience, and you see eternity like a vast landscape deployed in front of you. So what I think psychedelics are is they're about time, and they somehow make all time co-present. And how this is possible, and why it's possible, I don't know. But I think perhaps this is what the myth of the fall is about, that what man's fall is, is really the fall into time, the time of a fading past, an unknown future, and a uh, very intense but very small area where things are going on called the present, there is some way in which that can be stepped out of. And it's not its not uh, an either-or situation. We are all to some degree in time, and we are all to some degree in eternity. And to the degree that we are in eternity, we behave correctly and have right activity and right perception. And these psychedelics enhance 
this involvement with the totality of everything. That's why it is not naive to suggest that issues like the nuclear gridlock and all these uh, other terminal problems that we have could be overcome if people would by any means try to come into attunement with the notion of unity in time and space of the species and the planet and the solar system and and i think this is the the evolving core idea which will either save us or the absence of its evolution will be our ruin the idea of unity and interrelatedness I, I would like to suggest that it's possible that both things are happening that there is a universe where it's unraveling and one where it's <coughs> we've already won and what wasn't it I, I mean wasn't it you who uh, Robert Anton Wilson I know has talked about it some uh, suggest that the future is already it's pulling us towards it I, and I like right. that and the, you talked about 12-12 as a step over point I've told 20, every, 12. 20, 12, <laughs> right. yeah, and I've told everybody that and, and a few days ago somebody told me that the Mayan uh, fifth wheel which we're on now ends in, tw in 2011 which it, I didn't know until it actually ends in 2012 it ends on the 21st of December 2012 just 30 days after the date that I picked from all the work we did with the I Ching yes somehow what, what did you do what, what how did you do that do you mind running it down really I, ca I can't understand your book I just can't understand <laughs> it and but, I'm so uh, engaging, you know but yeah the apocalypse is the millennium, and uh, the psychedelics move you into the future. We are all occupying different places in historical time. I mean, some of us are completely uncivilized Neanderthals. I mean, and some of us are very uptight 18th century sort of people interested in the social contract and the obligations of class and party and and some of us are uh, future people and this is the whole you don't have to wait for society to move into the future you can just make it happen around you and if everyone did that we could leap a thousand years into the future. I try to tell people that. That's one of the things that I say. Well, people come on, oh, well, are we going to make it through the nuclear thing and stuff? And I say, oh, listen, man, I've visited the future. I know there's a future. I don't know whether there's one for you, but I'm sure there's one for me because I've seen myself in it, right? And I keep coming back, and you keep coming back, and we all keep coming back. I is. Uh, because we've got a whole this great thing and we want everybody to share it. But we have a few little things we can work out ourselves on the way. <laughs> yes, well, <laughs> by there. everybody by example. I think that the whole thing, the crux of the whole psychedelic issue is that it, uh, it accentuates personal responsibility by making people take their own experiences seriously. People completely undervalue themselves. They think that they are spectators to life. They think that the great scientific breakthroughs, the great works of art, the great political upheavals will all be brought to them on the tube and explained by Newsweek. They don't realize that all of that is illusion and that what is central is the immediacy of personal experience and that if you work with that, you can just leave history and move off sideways from it and become your own Magellan. This is what people are doing in their living rooms, taking psilocybin in darkness late at night. They are the Columbuses of the new world of the human, of the human spirit. And uh, by taking responsibility, by abandoning the myth of... Um, that science, government, the military, and the churches are the forces which make culture. And just realizing culture is what we're doing at this very moment. The evolution of historical thought is what we're doing at this very moment. Maybe uh, before, I have one more thing, and then I think that you all ought to get a little technical before you have to go, but uh, I, I always like to ask people if there's something I haven't asked that they feel people ought to hear right now at this as you know this place in the infinity sign 
No, I'm very tricky. I unburdened myself early That's on of right. what I wanted to say, what I thought should let, be gotten let, out. Let's talk about, just for a few minutes, about your book, uh, your cassette book, oh, and right. that and where people can order. What's in it? What's it about? And okay, well, it's a, a book called, I wrote a book called True Hallucinations, which was the story behind the invisible landscape, the story of an amazing expedition to the Amazon in the early 70s, in which we met the saucers, or at least I never want to meet them more closely than that, and discovered the mushroom, which we brought back, which we wrote our book about, and Basically, it's just the wildest experience I've ever had or ever heard of. Uh, read onto eight cassettes as a nine and a half hour talking book with wonderful uh, special effects and musical backgrounding and that sort of thing. Well, that, that gave us uh, a concise thing here before they started making too much so noise, which was really great. So, Lou, I know, has a lot of questions, and before we break up, it would be neat to hear you all. I, I can take or not take. I think you well, probably like me. Thank you, first of all, Liz. I think people like you are really the shock troops of the New Order, because the whole thing that we're all doing is information, and the radio is uh, very, very important. I know, that's why I've got to get it together to package this program and send it out around to... I want to send it to the... Um, to those spots in the United States that have enough aware population to enjoy it. I, I think there are probably 30 to 50 of them anyway. Well, you may so. get better, but you're just fine the way you are. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> all right, I know. It's an all-win situation. <laughs> So, um, I, do you want to go back to where you were talking about, because that led us into why organic stuff. We were talking about... Oh, we were talking about cauldron chemistry. And, and alchemy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there are many, uh, an interesting thing to think about in regard to shamanism and all that is that there may be many situations where natural products can be combined to make a powerful hallucinogen, where the components themselves are not. The most obvious known example of that is ayahuasca in the Amazon, where DMT in Socotria viridis is potentiated by taking MAO inhibiting harmine from Banisteriopsis capi. But uh, there may be m many potentials for these kinds of things. For instance, uh, why were the Druids so interested in mistletoe? Let's look at the chemistry of mistletoe and try to imagine ways in which mistletoe might be brought in that direction. The Arundo Donex case is another one. The Chinese, many of the mushrooms in the Chinese pharmacopoeia could be looked at as well. Uh, Ayurvedic medicine, there are traces of combinatory hallucinogens. So this is actually an area where not a lot of work has been done. And in fact, generally, synergies have not been studied. Synergies are a situation where two compounds are put together to get an effect. And even, uh, even pharmaceutically and medically, the synergies that occur with various drugs have not, not been well studied. The, um, there, there were a few areas that uh, uh, I spent some time thinking about. One of the most the, is the... Uh, what I call lower life form biochemical conversion processes or um, uh, ways in which things are transmitted perhaps from termites through termitomyces through, through uh, tool making behavior in, in chimpanzees uh, through that this transfer of information occurs and continues to occur and so that each uh, organism, perhaps, in its combination, the flies which are stupefied by muscaria as it decays, are eaten by the frogs whose legs in turn are, and so there's a lore or a processing that goes on in that way as one form. The other is um, a chroma puncture, an area selectively, that the body is selectively sensitive to certain um, colors, to certain um, chemicals in certain areas. And that this is another area that isn't really understood or hasn't been looked into. No, you make and a very the, good point. The other would be olfactory intoxicants. That they, there's a critical um, uh, t 
timing and involvement, I think, that has to go on to, in order to optimize an experience. And I think the olfactory component is another one that needs to be um, considered. Pheromones are uh, aromatic compounds which uh, are message-bearing chemicals that uh, insects give off, but plants also give off pheromones. And in fact, the more it's looked into, the more it appears that everything is giving off pheromones. And, and the plainer nature of hallucinogens suggests that they may be, in some sense, natural hallucinogens, super pheromones. They are actually bearing, message-bearing compounds whose purpose is to communicate between one species and another or within a species. For instance, the language of insects is not a language of sound, but a language of chemical excretion. And uh, how complex this language is, we don't know because we can't uh, pierce into it. But I studied for a while under Dr. Ralph Audi, who was a great geographer and medical epidemiologist, and he suggested that hallucinogens should be looked upon as a subset of pheromones. And I know when you're in the Amazon, you just breathe this air which is laden with thousands of chemical messengers of all sorts that are setting the ambiance of the whole biosphere and uh, th this has not been looked at, it's not well understood. There was an amazing article written a few years ago by a man named Harry Weiner who wrote an article called External Chemical Messengers, ECM he called them, and uh, in the New York Journal of Medicine, and he outlined a whole theory of how this regulated species and interspecies relations. He talked about how when you walk into a room full of people, you get an immediate gestalt impression, which he felt was olfactory, that you were sensing the psychic conditions of everyone by taking a lung full of the message-laden chemicals that everybody was exuding. He talked about psychiatrists who would diagnose schizophrenia by smell. They would just walk over to the person and take a hit of their body odor and felt, you know, that... And, and he even suggested that what perhaps uh, some forms of schizophrenia are is miscuing socially because your pheromone system is haywire so you're giving off what can only be described as a weird vibe and so people relate to you weirdly and that makes you weirder and it makes them weirder mm -hmm. and you get this feedback lock and it's essentially because your invisible ex chemical messenger computer <coughs> is broken down um. Uh, what I was uh, thinking was that if we could get back a little bit to the combination of the, uh, let's say, the tryptamine, the DMT, and the um, harmine, or those those combinations, and also to get to the fugu, if I know very little about it, and it would be nice if, if you have some thoughts on the, on the chemistry of the fugu and the what is nude. The fugu? It's the um, a fish that's eaten in Japan. Oh. Yes, I don't know actually anything about that particular fish. I know that there are fish eaten off Norfolk Island, which is an island off the west coast of Australia. In fact, there's an amazing description of a trip in Hoffer and Osmond's book, Hallucinogens. Uh, uh, this person, this happened in the early 60s, they, they saw a monument to the first landing on the moon and had all these super science fiction visions of the future that they had not expected to get high. It was an accidental. They had caught this fish, roasted it on the beach, and ate it. Uh, and in Hawaii, there are similar fish. And about six species are implicated. And I think in all cases, DMT is the compound. But not a lot of animal tissue contains utilizable amounts of hallucinogens. For instance, I don't think it's ever, no hallucinogenic insect has ever been confirmed, although there are persistent reports of a grub, a palm grub, an a immature beetle form in Brazil, which is hallucinogenic, and uh, 
occasionally butterflies are mentioned as hallucinogenic, but it's never been confirmed. So this is an area where research needs to be done. When, uh, <clears throat> if one were to be able to make, say, DMT from the rabbit lungs and were able to obtain the uh, hamine from the Russian thistle or the uh, other plants, uh, how would one proceed in terms of combining these uh, in the most effective way? Well, you want a, a you want MAO inhibition, so you have to take an effective dose of the MAO inhibitor, and then uh, the DMT is usually potentiated at a dose lower than the effective dose without the MAO inhibitor, and probably since these things are degraded substantially in the gut, the most effective way of doing it would be to smoke it. Or sublingual absorption is also a direct route that avoids the degradation in the digestive system.